I don't know who you are, but welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Sit back, relax, and listen about cameras, gear, settings, stories, and all things photography. Join Dermot and Darren on Ireland's Best Photography Podcast. Let's go. And you're very welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast, and it's episode 99, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host in Limerick, Mr. Dermot O'Donovan. Dermot, how are you getting on, buddy? I'm good, Darren. Jesus, thanks for asking. Um, this week is going well. My one-to-one series is starting to pick up a small bit. Got some great views on Greg Snell's one, and now we have Michael Prey coming on Thursday. So, and there's been a few people messaging me, um, are very excited to see the next episode. And we have Peter Cox coming the week after that then, so... Yeah, really good times lie ahead for this series and have high hopes for it. Good, good. Fair play to you, man. You know, you're flying it and you're getting some great guests as well. I'm really enjoying them anyway. But I wonder, actually, you know, somebody else with us on the podcast and we are still in isolation. So we said to reach out and see how others are getting on. And this evening we're joined by Blake Rudis from the F64 Academy. Blake, how are you getting on, buddy? I'm good. Doing well. Fine. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, William Blake. Appreciate it, dude. I appreciate you having me. It's, it's a real honor. You know, I'm actually 50% Irish, so... I'm just gonna go ahead and change this. Yeah. <laughs> change this over to green for you guys. Oh, uh, good night. Look at that. Bula boss. That's unreal. Look at that. There we go. There we go. They're all green now. It, it looks phenomenal, and it's actually you know I kind of paid a homage to you this evening because I said I'd go dark as well for my setup and put on my green lights. You know because when I look at your set and I watch you on YouTube, it always looks fantastic with the colours that are in the background. So I'm delighted that you changed it to green in our honour for this evening. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me, uh, how have you been getting on so far? Uh, before we get into anything else, how have you getting on so far in isolation? Are you like, bored yet? Are you finding things to do? Are you catching up on things that you've always said you get done? I've been in isolation since 2014. So <laughs> <laughs> this is really nothing different uh, for us as a family. It's kind of like summer would be without okay. the vacations or the you know pool parties or anything like that. So it really is like... I've been doing this for six years in my office. I very rarely leave the house, but now I have to okay. do it with a mask on and gloves mm-hmm. and full on sandy suit. But <laughs> yes. other than that, yes. we're, we're doing great. You know, we're, we, we're pretty blessed that we can just kind of hang out at home and enjoy our life that way. So for us, it's kind mm-hmm. of business as usual. And things are crazy now because, you know, being an online photo educator, a lot of people are looking at the content, a lot of emails. Yes. Uh, my email customer service side has probably increased by about 30, 40, 50 percent. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty so, crazy. You know, you, you, you have something as well. So I suppose that is in demand for when people have their time as well. Now, they've always said, I wanted to do something. I wanted to learn. And we we've already said it on a couple of episodes back in the podcast. Things to do. Learn a new skill, you know. Uh, put your mind to use and keep it active and I think it's a great time to be able to kind of do that and obviously you know in regards to what you've created it's it's perfect for that so yeah absolutely and you know it's I've been trying to stay away from the media anyway just because the media tells you what they want you to hear and not what's really happening so I just mm-hmm. kind of bury myself in my office business as usual my wife gives me the cliffs notes on what's going on in the world and it's good <laughs> so <laughs> And I suppose, Blake, tell us, you know, before we start anything, tell us who is Blake Rudis? So um, kind of the elevator pitch is uh, I've been doing art since I was like five years old, whenever I could pick up or a pen or a pencil and any media you could possibly put in front of me, but sculpting, painting, uh, you name it. Uh, I got my degree in printmaking and sculpture with a um, interest in painting. So I have a color theory background and, and mainly a fine art background. Uh, around 2006, I got into photography, and then it was all over. Uh, by 2010, I had put all my paints away, stopped sculpting, and just dove headfirst into photography. Um, wow. 2010 is when I got really serious about it. Um, so pretty much uh, then 2016, I ended up transitioning into F64 Academy from an older blog that I had. Uh, it's kind of okay. embarrassing, but if you ever saw Everyday HDR, <laughs> I was like... The HDR guy. <laughs> I drink Jer- that. Jeremy cool- loves HDR. Yeah, don't you, Jeremy? Christ, <laughs> mother of God. Well, you know, there was a time when everyone 
did it. And uh, now we actually probably are still doing HDR to a degree. But uh, <coughs> pardon me, our well, camera well, sensors. More right. Our camera yeah, sensors refined. can handle the amount of information coming in. So there's no need to do HDR. So if I didn't rebrand in 2016, I was pretty much going to go down with that ship. So I moved mm-hmm. really quick. Mm-hmm. But that, mm-hmm. that's me in a nutshell. I, uh, I operate F64 Academy on YouTube, which most people have probably seen. And then F64 Academy <coughs> Elite is my um, subscription program that has a lot more content on it as well. So, tell, tell us a bit more about the Academy. So you say, you know, you rebranded in regards to that, but the idea had been there beforehand and what you do within the Academy. Tell us a bit more about how the idea started and what actually is uh, the F64 Academy right now. So what I realized when I was in Everyday HDR is that people really liked my tutorials and I was boxed in. I was enclosed into only doing tutorials on HDR processing. And uh, okay. what I realized was that I was really more of like a Photoshop super nerd than I was like an HDR <laughs> photographer. So um, by around 2016, it was like I was making up tutorials because I, I wanted to stay in that box as long as I could. And uh, I had asked a company if I could teach for them at one of their seminars, and, and they basically told me, they said, hey, look, HDR is dead, so um, unless you are doing something else, uh, we don't really need you coming out here. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, I'm, I'm really wow. going really to put my... my, my here, yeah. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like hammering nails in my own coffin. So uh, yeah. I rebranded out of that. Now I, I, I really focus strongly on... Uh, intermediate to hyper advanced Photoshop techniques, um, pretty much how people would describe me, like PhD level. I've been told that before. I mean, those are all. I, I think I teach to a basic level, but you know, if you're a inner, if you're a, in beginner in Photoshop, but you watch one of these tutorials, you're like, what? <laughs> so I guess I'm more of the advanced guy. But you know, I, you know, it's just what I do. So I try to teach people to get from that beginning level into that hyper advanced level so that they can be doing the same thing with their photos that I do in mine. So I don't hold any secrets back. I give everything away that I can and pretty much 90% of what I do is free. So. Wow. That, that, that's, that's impressive to say the least genuinely like, but uh, before we move on to somewhere, whereabouts in America are you from? Kansas city. So um, originally from Delaware, but then, you know, moving all over the place. Now I'm like smack dab in the middle of the country in uh, Kansas city, Missouri. And is there much to photograph there uh, as a landscape perspective or anything like that? There's nothing here. <laughs> <laughs> Literally so nothing. I'm still excited when you say that. <laughs> well, and you know what? It's it's like there's two reasons why I moved out here. Uh, number one, I'm in the military, so I moved here for some uh, some military yeah. stuff, um, and I do that uh, part time. So um, the next reason was um, we needed to get closer to family. Cost of living is really low. I was living in the Bay Area of California, which was just ungodly expensive. expensive. So yeah. uh, we had to get away from there to start a family. And then what I realized, though, is that when I moved out here, I became a better photographer uh, because I really had to f- look for something to photograph as opposed to just walking up and taking a picture. Because the California coast, I mean, you, you can't go wrong there, you know. It's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. but here you, it's like, OK, is it, what? how what's the light that i need for that cow to just look gorgeous you know that rim light on the ear of the cow you know like here there's not much but it keeps me productive in other ways you know so so then coming back to the f64 academy like so let's just say like darren is not very good at photoshop i'm not far True ahead from either you know it's just we're, we're not really into that we're kind of more of quick fix photographers if that makes any bit of sense or not so the F64 Academy, can we jump into that or is it for more the advanced people or is it kind of a mix and match for everyone? Anyone really can. I like to try and teach to what I call the lowest common denominator. Not to say that you guys are the lowest okay. common denominator, but... I have. Uh, well, I, have. <laughs> <laughs> I get confused by the amount of buttons that are in Photoshop, Blake. <laughs> I don't like to uh, assume that people know everything going into a tutorial, so I'll often start with some background information on it. Um, I might start with some of the basic stuff on it and then move into that advanced topic that I want to talk about so that I don't leave everyone behind. So if you have a basic, I'd say that, you know, if you know how layers work and how masking works, you can pretty much watch any one of my tutorials um, and you wouldn't have any problems. 
I could watch him. Darren still can't watch him, so. No, I, st- <laughs> I still can't watch them. I mean, and, you know, I suppose that is the question, you know, like it, it, you're starting out from a, a, a beginner point of view, you learn the basics, you learn what you need to figure out, and then you can move in to say, okay, I want to be able to refine those techniques, I imagine, Blake, yeah? Right. So on F64 Academy Elite, which is the subscription program, I've got 28 courses on there. And the way I do those courses, I'll, I'll take a small topic. I'll take even the smallest topic you can think of. And I'll expand it into something huge. So like cropping. Okay. How many how many minutes do you think a cropping video should be? <laughs> oh, Two okay. seconds. Hang on. No, it, it, that's already a loaded question. It's Sorry, a loaded probably, question. Yeah. It's probably in the high teens, if not more, maybe. It was two hours, minutes. two hour video, wow. two hour video series on cropping. Two hours. Wow. Yeah. Two hours. But that's what I'm saying. I'm going to go when, when you, the, this, the way I kind of dig into course material like wow. that is I take a small thing, a very small thing and expand it out. Whereas opposed okay. to what many people do in the industry is they take a big topic and they make it small. Okay. Well, if you're trying to learn, you don't know all the stuff in that big topic and they're already trying to shrink it and condense it. They're already not doing it the right way, you know? So these small topics expanded into large uh, topics, then you you can compartmentalize things and say, okay, well cropping as it, as it pertains to printing, cropping as it pertains to the web, cropping as it pertains to, um, you know, you name it, you know? So Mm -hmm. then it goes into each crop tool where you should crop, what part of the workflow you should crop, what happens if you crop too early, you know, what happens if you crop your pants? (laughs) It's not like, you know, (laughs) I was, wa- I, was waiting. <laughs> I was waiting for just that right time. But yeah, so it's just a matter of like taking small things, expanding it into large things, because that's how you're going to get the the most knowledge on any given topic. It does make sense. I mean, you, I mean, you say it there as well. You think about originally you said about a PhD in Photoshop, but you can actually fact have a PhD in composition and cropping by getting the whole I suppose, concept, the execution, the modification of everything that you do to come up with something completely different than what you originally thought it was going to be. Right. Right. And that's what a lot of people, when they join F64 elite, they don't realize that like F64 Academy, I do like 300 videos or 400 videos on my YouTube channel, but there's Mm -hmm. 1600 videos on F64 Academy elite. So the difference is that, you know, this is going to go a lot farther. It's going to take you farther and there's more to learn. So I might do, you know, 10 to 15 minute video on a topic on YouTube. But when I say that there's more on this place, there's more on this place. You know, that's a lot of times, you know, you might say, well, how, how much can you do with one blend mode? Well, you know, let's look at it. Let's see how many (laughs) different ways we can beat the crap out of this blend mode until we can't use it anymore. So, yeah. Well, if you can spend 18 minutes on a crop tool, I'm sure you could spend four hours on a, on a, what you just said there. What was it? Blend modes. <laughs> See, I'm already lost. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, and it really is like people just, they, they think that like, and I've, I've heard it from my subscribers are like, you know, how do you have all of this insane knowledge? And it's like, I don't, (laughs) what you guys don't understand is it's just like Facebook. I'm showing you the highlight reels of the things that worked. I'm not Mm -hmm. showing you the 3000 hours that I sat here over the course of three years trying to get this thing to work for me. You know what I mean? So, and then I'll divide it and break it up into something that's palatable for them so that they get Mm -hmm. how to learn. They learn how to use that in three hours as opposed to me, trying to learn it for three years. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm, basically mm-hmm. it's just taking the, the experiments that I have, chopping them up and delivering them out rather than just trying to jump in and say, okay, let's talk about curves today. And then for the rest of the month, because you know, you have to look at the application for it. So from a person who first starts out on Photoshop, you've seen a lot of people, I imagine over the years that, you know, they move from film, they move to digital and then they discover Photoshop. And, you know, something I've kind of often said to a lot of people when you get Photoshop is remember that the dials aren't designed to go to 10. But what really do you find is the biggest mistake that people would make when they first come to Photoshop, I suppose? Using filters. <laughs> I mean, okay. The first thing I did, I, I remember getting Photoshop in 1998, I believe. Um, and all I did was use filters because I didn't know that there was like anything other than filters. Um, but I, I, ultimately, I think it's people get intimidated by it and they think that it's an untamable beast. But 
just like anybody who's ever had any animal and has trained an animal, um, if you try to say, okay, today I'm going to get this animal to go outside and pee outside, then come back into the house and go into the kennel and stay there. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that takes, it takes months. So, but you have to work yeah. on small things. So like I, yes. I used to teach survival school in the military. And one of the things that we taught was don't ever plan to be rescued. If you're out there, you, you, you want to be rescued. And ultimately that's your goal. But if that's your yes. only goal, you're going to die. So you have True. to, you have to say, okay, I need to find a water source. Then I need to find shelter or make shelter. Then I need to find a food source. Then I need to be able to build a fire. Now I need to start working on my smoke signal. How am I going to hold these individuals? So in order to get rescued, you got to do all four of these things first. So you're not going to okay. get rescued until these four things happen or five things or whatever that might be. And Photoshop's the same way. You're not going to learn the program as a whole and jump in there and be like, I'm a Photoshop genius. You got to say, <clears throat> okay, let's go. Voop. Okay, let's just talk about opacity for three hours. What is opacity? You know, what is fill? Okay. What is, and then, and then as you incrementally dive into each one of those things, you don't want to take on too many things either. You want to just yes. say, okay, today or this whole week, if you take 52 weeks out of the year and take 40 minutes a day, not even an hour a day, and devote it to that one thing, curbs, 40 minutes a day for a week. Okay. Next week, 40 minutes a day on gradients. 40 minutes a day on gradient maps for 52 weeks. And you do that for 52 different items. You've just learned a ton more than what you would have learned if you just jumped in there and tried to dabble with everything. So yeah. it's small incremental steps. It's not like today I'm going to master Photoshop. It ain't going to happen. So yeah, you know, I'm recording a course on Photoshop mastery. Now that starts from opening Photoshop to closing Photoshop and everything that happens in between. And you know, 30 lessons we're talking like, 14 or 15 hours worth of content, 30 minutes a day. Wow. Um, that, I mean, that, that's even, okay. that's even considered like hyper speed learning Photoshop. I would rather do a 52 mm -hmm. week Photoshop course. You know what I mean? Cause it would make mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. sense, but yeah, yeah. But people yeah. would be scared of that. Like, but like when you say, you know, the, the whole rescue part, the first thing that came into my mind is uh, Pat Riley. I don't know if you know him. He's the general manager of the Miami heat. Right. And he says, he always says you have to be an active participant in your own rescue. So that's the first thing that jumped into my head. And like, it's mad how you kind of uh, associate these things with others. But look, like getting onto luminosity masking, right? I, I had um, the lads come on and did a, a critique of my video. So a few kind of well-known lads in the industry. And they all, the common denominator of every photograph that they critiqued was my haloing. So they said, maybe if you start- And your highlights. And your uh, highlights. One highlight, feck off. Uh, Two highlights. <laughs> so, so, I've yeah, been like saying said, to you for years, but anyway, you never, you never uh, asked me to come on to, well, I'd forgive him critique, I suppose you knew what I was going to say to you. Go on there, sorry. Uh, anyway, so yeah, you finished there, Darren, thanks. Uh, yeah, I finished, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so the lads were kind of saying, do you know, hit Luminosity Max, start learning about them, and so I kind of got on to Greg Benz, and I ended up uh, getting the, buying the course, or not the course, just the program off him. So, like, luminosity masks in photoshop like is it a very good program to marry one with another or am i better off to not learn those programs and just work how to learn how to do it in photoshop itself without the programs do you get me am i making sense i don't know i get you 100 percent. and you know so a lot of a lot of us have kind of our own you know panels and workflows and stuff and i've got what people call a luminosity masking panel but i don't really care for luminosity masks themselves I have a video okay. on YouTube that you should look for. It's called how to make luminosity masks look like child's play. And literally like luminosity masks are extremely powerful for what they are and what they do. Um, they make a selection of your highlights. They make a selection of your midtones. They make a selection of your shadows. Now you might say to yourself, well, why don't I just do that in Lightroom? They've got highlights and shadows in there, right? Yes. Yeah. But you don't see the shadow. You don't see the highlight. You have no idea what yeah. Lightroom is doing. You have absolutely no freaking clue what selection of highlights they're selecting or what selection of shadows they're selecting. So you make mm -hmm. a baseline photo. I call it a low dynamic range image from Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom that almost looks like an old school HDR without the grunge. Okay. <laughs> open that in Photoshop. Then you do your luminosity masking to open up and close down certain areas of your Photoshop to basically turn the lights on and off for people to see. So that's kind of the basics of the things that I do. Um, what I prefer over luminosity masking, though, the traditional luminosity masking is something called blend if. 
And blend if is a lot more powerful. It's extremely more potent because a mask takes a selection of an object and then you're stuck with that mask. Sure, you can refine that mask later, but if you put something underneath there, that highlight doesn't change. If you made a mask for a highlight, it stays a mask for a highlight, right? Mm -hmm. Well, with luminosity mm -hmm. masking, yes. luminosity masking, you can put a layer on there, make a selection for your highlights with uh, blend if, okay? And okay. then everything you put underneath there, as your highlights change, this will move too. So there's never yeah. truly a mask that locks you in place, ever. I, I, I kind of get it, but then just at the final hurdle, I was like, no, I didn't get it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> think, I, of it like, <laughs> think of it like a boat on water, okay? So okay. blend if is the boat, and as the water moves underneath, the boat constantly moves okay. with it. Ah, now, okay. I like that one. Yeah. That one's much Illum easier. A luminosity mask is a freaking rock. <laughs> It stays there while okay. the water does this. Okay. And then the cool thing about blend if is if you learn blend if really well, you can do all your adjustment layers with blend if, turn them into a lookup table, and then turn yes. that into oh, a yeah. profile. And then you have all uh -huh. of the hard work that you did in Photoshop at the raw level in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. Now that is freaking mind blowing. That is pretty cool. I like that one. No, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a double. <laughs> But you I mean, see, the, it, it is it is because I'm trying to explain it to you in 30 but seconds. No, but it makes sense. Yeah, but it makes sense of what you're saying to me because I'm going, I never even thought about something like that before. But as you explain it, like exactly with the movement of the water, and then you take all that and bring it back into Lightroom, I'm like, okay, I want to know this. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, more, tell me more. Go on, Blake, tell me more. It's incredible. It's incredible. So, you know, there's a course that I have called the Zone System Express, and that course has a panel, most of it's blend if related. So it has all the one click blend if stuff there. Um, but I don't ever want someone to just use my panel and click the button. I want them mm -hmm. to know everything about that. So in the education, I explain everything, everything first and then show you where it is on the panel. So I'll explain yeah. how to curves adjustment layer, then show it on the panel. I'll explain blend if, then show it on the panel. I'll explain everything first and then show it on the panel which makes you know 10 hours worth of education that comes with the panel but by the end of it i mean people are coming out with literally phd level stuff it's phenomenal watching a new person come into my facebook group not knowing anything about this stuff really putting it into practical application and then within weeks their work is insanely better no i was just saying like this this, this is just phenomenal to hear like that's that, like basic human beings like you, me and Darren could actually end up being good at this shit. <laughs> you know, I, I, I never <laughs> thought of it that way, really. Like I, I'm good with Lightroom. I'm very well, I'm very well, oh jeez, I'm mixing up my words. I'm very good with Lightroom, but. Not very good at speaking English. Oh Jesus, <laughs> too many beers tonight, Ned. Oh, uh, that's funny. No, I, 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 like, I would say a 92 year old man, he emailed me after he bought the Zone System Express. And he said, I'm 92. I just need some help. And I was wow. like, oh, crap. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to end up giving this guy a refund. I, I was like right about to push the refund button. He goes, if you stick with me, I'm going to learn this before I die. And he's oh, still wow. alive. <laughs> Two years later, he's still sending me images that are just unbelievable. At 92 wow. years old. You know, like anyone, anyone can learn this stuff at any age. It's just how much you want to apply yourself to it really is what it comes down to. One of the things I suppose that I noticed in, you know, looking up obviously details and seeing details passing over time is that you talk about workflow and, you know, how important workflow is to be able to create the end result of the image. Tell us a bit more about uh, your workflow ideas. I mean, how long of a, uh, is it a module? Is it a course specifically on workflow? Is it a part within a part or does it deserve something with on, on its own? So my workflow, um, over the years, I've, I've tried to compartmentalize my workflow and say, okay, when you go into Photoshop, use a curves adjustment layer, but that, that's not really accurate. I mean, some, sometimes I won't need that. Sometimes I won't need a gradient. Sometimes I won't need a gradient map. Sometimes I will. So mm -hmm. I've taken my workflow and I've broken it down into compartments rather than items that you must do. These are compartments that you must do. So, and it, it's the okay. order. So you get your tones, right? You get your colors right, and then you do your artistic effects. Tone, color, artistic effects. Tone, color, artistic effects. Most of my subscribers that are watching this, they they 
dream of this stuff at night because I say it so much in every one of my videos. <laughs> so it's not necessarily one course that creates the tone color effects workflow. It's something that I kind of keep. That's my common thread that goes through all my education is where is this a tone effect? Is this a color effect? So the way I kind of operate, it's like I get my tones as natural as they were to that time. I get my mm -hmm. colors as natural as they were at that time. That's where most people stop and they put that online or they put that on the web or they think that's where it ends. But really there's one big step after that called artistic effects. And that's where you take your mood, your feelings and your emotion and you insert it into the photograph so someone else can see that and feel it. Wow. And okay. so I do critique sessions on my F64 elite website, elite website. and, uh, that was weird. I just heard myself come through. So I do critique yeah. sessions on my F64 Elite website. And on that website, what I notice is that most people get tone and color down just right. And they've got these technically perfect photos. But it's almost like they fear that artistic effect world that they should and need to go into so that they can actually make the viewer feel what they feel. I call it reverse empathy. It's like an empathetic person is someone who, if you go through something, is feeling what you're feeling. Okay. Yes. Now I've felt something for the landscape that I'm in. I need to make you feel what I felt. So it's reverse empathy. I need to make you feel the feelings that I felt. So I need to dig into my feelings, pull out the colors that I, that make that mood happen, deliver it to you. So you feel what I felt without me being even in the room. And that's where impactful photography comes from. So if you stick to tone, color, artistic effects and tone and color, are the easiest parts. But the artistic mm -hmm. effect part, that's where I spend about, I would say, 80% of my time. And that's where I okay. spend so, most of my time teaching others. So, so right, just say if you selected kind of tone, like a blue tone to kind of make you feel sad or cold in a scene, but then you get to the artistic kind of thing. What what you mean by that? I, I, I'm lost there. So tones would be like your highlights, shadows, midtones. So getting those things looking good. Colors would be like your accurate color representation of what blue water would look like or what green grass would look like. Okay. And then the artistic effect phase, that's where you color grade things. So if you've ever watched any television shows that um, yeah, like some of the big ones here in America are like Game of Thrones or mm -hmm. Ozark or something like that. And those Breaking Bad. Bad, Breaking Bad, those movies and those television shows look so good to you. But if you saw them yeah. without their color grading on there, you wouldn't watch the mm -hmm. show. Because mm -hmm. there's there's subliminal messages that are put into all those scenes to make you feel a certain way. There's even some scenes like, you know, in Game of Thrones where they're up in the north, everything's really blue and dreary. Well, it's not really yes. like that. If you walk through the north, it wouldn't be blue and dreary. It would be white. There'd be white snow. You know what I mean? Like, But then when you go to the south, it's like epic orange and reds and yellows that are so vibrant and saturated. Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> So, Mexico is all orange and everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know what I'm saying there. And that's that's kind of what we do with our photographs. If you want to make someone feel something with a subliminal message, that's the part and time where you insert that stuff. But the reason why you get tone and color looking good first is because you can't polish a turd. Okay. So <laughs> if you take a try it, try it. If you take <laughs> maybe a petrified turd, but you can't do a fresh one. So if you get a photo straight out of your camera and you apply the artistic effects to that image without doing anything with your tones and colors first, it's going to look muddy and it's going to look bad. And that's typically what you see. But when you see someone who really knows the process, they've got their tones down, they've got their colors down. Now they know that that's the time to polish and refine things. That's when they start in inserting that mood and that emotion into the image because these parts are already done. If you try to do it too soon, though, you'll see. Like, go into split toning in Lightroom and start messing with split toning. It's going to look yeah. god awful. But yes, do that yeah, in Photoshop totally. after you've got all that stuff looking beautiful. And, man, it just bling. I've I've two questions for you. How does that principle work on black and white images? It's just different shades of gray in the color. So with black and white, I consider black and white an artistic expression or artistic effect. Some people disagree yeah. with this, um, but what I mean by that is I do my tones, I do my colors, <laughs> and then I throw a non-destructive black and white adjustment on top in Photoshop with a gradient map. And then you okay. can put an HSL adjustment layer under there, and you can actually modify your colors and make tonal yeah, adjustments much. with your colors underneath your black and white image. So I still say get tone good, get color good, 
then put your black and white conversion on top and then go into the colors underneath that black and white version to see what what the tone what happens with the tones Mm, brilliant. Okay, we're going to take a very quick break. I'm going to come back with my second question actually on that part. So we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Are you tired of running out of power at that crucial moment? Do you need to charge two batteries simultaneously or charge on the go while in your car? The award-winning Pro Cube 2 from Halo has got you covered. Available for Canon, Nikon, Sony and Panasonic. Visit Halo.ie. And you're very welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast. And, you know, Blake, I had a question there for you before we went for break, and it was got to do with the artistic effect that you bring out in the latter part of the image. And that can be the hardest thing to do because it's a static 2D image of a 3D scene, and there's an emotion that you felt when you were there, and you try and bring that emotion across to the viewer of the image. Something I've heard a lot of people talk about in the last number of months and years, really, is a thing called the Orton effect. Is that exactly something that you're thinking of here to be able to bring out that artistic effect or the emotion or even the, the flare within the image that's hidden within so with the the orton effect is like a way of basically taking the image that you have blurring it and then changing the blend mode to something like soft light or screen or just altering the blend mode so that the blurred version of whatever you've created creates a heightened contrast within the colors in your image and that's that's essentially what the orton effect is um okay. i do a version of the orton effect but it's like the orton effect on crack so <laughs> The Blake effect. <laughs> My subscribers know it as the customized radiance 2.0 because there was a 1.0 version of this, but it's a radiating effect. And I don't want to call it the Orton effect because it's something completely different. And I would say that 90% of my images that you see anywhere, if you see any of my portfolio pieces, go through this customized radiance because what it does is it it's just like the, the finishing refined touch on like you can make a cake. And you could put, you know, a crumb coat on there, which is, just, you know, just kind of putting some icing on there. And then you can put, mm -hmm. you know, your icing that's going to go on the top and you can call it done. And the cake is still going to taste good. But yes. it's about the presentation now. It's like, OK, what whips do you put here and what dots do you put there? And how do you make this cake look fantastic that someone wants to dig into it? Yes. So what this is, it's kind of like a pass through where it's going to do the same type of blurring effect. But then I put a highlights and shadows adjustment on it from the HDR days on top of just that blurred effect so that I can control the highlights and the shadows of the radiating effect and push and pull the light just on the radiating effect and not on the rest of the image. And then when it's done, I have a curves adjustment layer that I can adjust on just that radiance part too. So it basically, it's kind of like really what it is. It's kind of like hyper dodging and burning yeah. in a way uh, because you're adding certain highlights to some spot, you're adding shadows to another spot. Um, and just cleaning it up and tightening it up. So the mm. Orton effect, if, if you don't know what you're doing with it, it can be detrimental. So um, I have these things I call artistic expression or technical flaw when I'm doing my artist, when I'm doing my critique sessions where I'll say, okay, I know what you were trying to do here. You were trying to make an artistic expression, but along the way you made a technical flaw. Here's the technical mm -hmm. flaw, and here's how you deduce where that technical f flaw came from so that that becomes artistic expression next time and not a flaw here. So like over HDR, for instance, is a technical flaw because we know that tone compression comes along with that. But somebody who doesn't know <laughs> HDR photography might do it and think that that's what it's supposed to look like when it's actually a technical flaw. What did you call it? I normally call it, that's an absolute bucket of shite. What did you call it there? The over what? <laughs> Overprocessed? I don't know. I don't remember what I call it. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, do, so do you love the, uh, the Arten filter preset for the people sell? So you must love that, yeah? Not, not really. I don't really, <laughs> I don't like preset stuff. Like, even if you look at my panels, yeah. like, my panels don't do preset things. They're workflow panels, so when you press a button, it might not do anything, but it's setting your layers palette up in a way that when you modify things, it's supposed to look like what it's supposed to look like. So okay. I'm, I'm not a big fan of presets. I do have a preset pack that I sell, but um, it's more of a workflow preset thing where when you click it, it does workflow-based things rather than, ta-da, look at my magic trick that makes your image look fan freaking tastic uh. and it, it just... <laughs> doesn't work. That's what I was, that was, that's what I was getting at. I wanted to poke yeah. you a smile. It's all. 
with all this refined information, this beautiful mind of yours, that it's just it's just baffling how you squeeze it all in there. I know you told us how you got it there. So did with all this in your mind, did you kind of like say, right, I need to start a YouTube channel to kind of use it as a kind of a bench for my students to kind of go there or, or how did it work? So why did you set up the YouTube channel? Was that part of the reason? So I started a YouTube channel back in 2010. I was, um, that was part of Everyday HDR was I just started a blog. I had no idea what I was doing. Back in 2010, I was pretty much like your average layman with a camera who was like, let, let me be the person that has a voice on the internet now. And back in 2010, there wasn't a whole lot of people doing it. So I had a pretty good space. <laughs> but I yeah. found out really quickly from people just how, how sharp you have to be if you're going to put yourself out there. Um, yeah. And I got a lot of bad comments in the very beginning. I got a lot of, um, you did that completely wrong. You're an idiot comments. Um, <laughs> so you learn real quick, like in your experimentation process, just how refined your stuff has to be before you put it out to the internet. So most of the stuff that I'm spouting out is not just from years of experimentation. It's years of experimentation and pressure. I mean, diamonds get made from pressure. And this is the pressure from people that are basically like, if you don't do this right, I'm going to show you how smart I am compared to you. So you, you have to be one up ahead of the person that's watching the video. I mean, really you do. Um, so the YouTube videos kind of came out because I wanted, I, I was actually working 10 hours a day, five days a week in my normal job. And I, the, the blog posts were taking me like six hours to write the technical ones. So I was like, man, I got to do something different. This is crazy. It's killing me. So I went to video because I was like, this is so much faster. I can record this thing in one take, you know, cause I didn't know how to edit a video. So I was like one take, mm -hmm. let's go, you know, one take wonder and just blah, I went through it. Okay. Put it up on YouTube, threw it up on my website and good. We're good. Right. I mean, if you look at yeah. early videos on my YouTube channel, you even see the old everyday HDR graphic, you know, the naive guy was like, Hey guys, today I'm going to teach you how to use the actions in Photoshop. <laughs> Um, I hope you, hope you like it. Just let me know. Oh, don't ever open that can of worms. Don't ever ask how you did. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it kind of came out of necessity because I had to do something quicker than writing. And I suppose, you know, you mentioned there about, you know, that it's, it's now evolved into something where people can learn and, you know, have a PhD effectively in Photoshop and getting better at what they're doing and such like that. Within the whole YouTube environment, you've made a number of videos is there one particular video that you've made out of all the videos that you've done, not even made necessarily Blake on YouTube, but that you've created? That's the favorite tutorial video that you've made. Gosh, you know, um, I just did a, a recent series on uh, workflow. It's a workflow series that when you join my email list, it comes out in three days over the course of three days. And there's one in there that I really enjoyed because I just had fun with it. Um, and those are the ones that I that I enjoy the most. They aren't the ones that are the most popular. Um, they aren't the sexy topics, you know. Um, those ones I tend to do just out of obligation because you kind of need to do those ones. But there's one I did where I dressed up as if I was a doctor. Okay. <laughs> and I was breaking Boy. down. <laughs> and I was breaking down. It was a medical emergency. <laughs> no, it was really, it was explaining how a layer works in Photoshop and how a layer is kind of like your anatomy and how each part of the layer is like a different piece of your body between like, you know, your, your respiratory system to your nervous system to your, you know, it was, it was just fun. It was a lot of fun. Didn't get a whole lot of hits. You know, it's one of those things where in this industry, you think to yourself, like, if I do this tutorial, it's going to go viral. Um, those are <laughs> the ones that go nowhere, you know, yes. but the ones where I'm like, <laughs> Like on a Thursday, I'm like, shit, I got to have a video for Friday. Um, let me just do this. And I put it out there and I rush it and it's like a mm -hmm. home run. Those are the ones that end up for oh. some reason, but they aren't my favorite. They're not the ones that I'm attached to. Like the ones that I'm attached to are the ones that I spend a lot of time on. Um, like that one where I've got like my doctor garb on, I look like an idiot and I'm trying <laughs> to teach you, you know, there's not much that I won't do to try and make sure that I can get my you know, message across to the viewer so that they learn it with analogies. I mm -hmm. speak a lot in analogies, mm -hmm. if you haven't realized that. Um, so that was a mm -hmm. good analogy for... One or two, yeah. One yeah. or two. <laughs> yeah, that was a good <laughs> analogy for that. But I don't know. I, I don't know. I've, I've done like over 2,000 tutorials between my YouTube channel, F64 Elite, and then wow, my premium man. courses. So it's kind of wow. hard, you know. 
that's hard to say. Mm. Mm. So let me let me put this to you. So, uh, in, like you're very well knowledge in the world of Photoshop, and like we have some phenomenal photographers in the world. Like even if you look at that Indian dude, what's it, Pixie, Pixie something? Like you know, he's he's phenomenal as well, just like yourself with Photoshop. But like, is there kind of like a photographer or an editor? that you really kind of currently kind of look up to and kind of like yeah this guy really impresses me with what he does and also is there someone from the past that you also seemed like the same like kind of you took followed their footsteps that's a good question so i try not to watch anybody's tutorials that have anybody that does tutorials i don't watch I don't want to watch Pix and Perfect. I don't want to watch, um, you know, Nick Page's videos. I'll watch their vlogs, but I don't want to watch mm-hmm. their tutorials. And the reason why I do this, is I don't want their process to kind of jade the way I think about my process. And I don't want mm. to ever feel like, oh crap, I just watched that. Then if I ever do a tutorial on that, I'm copying them. So I just avoid all tutorials altogether. Um, so I don't really. The people that I that inspire me are really the good photographers out there. Uh, one of my favorites is Josh Snow, and I know Josh Snow personally because I did a, a, a seminar with him a couple of years ago. And the dude's been doing photography for like four years, right? Wow. He, he's a pretty good friend of mine at this point. But at that point, he only been doing photography for like two years, and his work is so powerful and so impactful that me, someone who's been an artist since I was five, thirty-two years of basically art knowledge. You know, um, I study color theory. I read books on color theory. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm constantly trying to make my photos better. I look at his stuff. I'm like, how did he do that? I'm like, wait a second. I should know how he did that because, (laughs) you know, like, but he's one of those people that I I look at and I'm just like, man, from the composition all the way through his color there it's unprecedented in my opinion. I don't think there's anybody out there like him the way he does his stuff. So I really look up to his photos. I was just talking to him on Saturday on the phone, actually telling him, um, how much I enjoyed his work. <laughs> so I was, I was like, I was like, dude, I said, you can never get out of photography ever period. He's like, why is that? I was like, because you'd be doing the world a disservice. Like that's the, that's the level that I enjoy his wow. work. That's high praise. That's high praise. This dude must be shit hot. What's his name again? Josh Snow. Josh Snow. Write that down. We got to look this dude up once we finish this. He's amazing. And he's a, he's a phenomenal guy. Uh, he's got a really, just a very jovial, very nice individual, you know, just doesn't have a mean bone in his body. Good guy. And was there anyone from prior to like, just say 2000? Is there someone that you kind of looked up to and going, man, this guy's just unbelievable, you know? I know it's like the cookie cutter answer, but it's Ansel Adams. I mean, hands down. And it's not so like what you guys are telling me about what you think about the way I think. I read his books. I've read his books front to back. I've got one called um, if you haven't read it, it's called The Negative. Uh, There's the the camera, the negative and the print. There are three books. It was written in like the 1940s. And this book called The Negative, I learned so much, even about digital photography. It wasn't even funny. I mean, you talk about curves. He's got curves in there from and like, he didn't even use curves back in the day. Like in his mind, like even in the beginning of that book, he even says that there's going to be processes in the future that are going to be amazing. And I, I can't wait to see what happens in the future of photography. Like he, he was so far ahead of his time. So when I first, when I developed my first course, it was called uh, Black, White and Beyond. It was the digital zone system. That was the first intro to what is now the zone system express but i read his book at least six times front to back i've got sticky wow. notes all over that thing highlighted like you wouldn't believe so then after after reading that book then going to yosemite and like buying some of his little prints on the postcard because i can't afford like the four thousand dollar ones um <laughs> you know and looking at just what he was able to do and what he was capable of doing in his time it's unbelievable. I mean, even today we, mm. we can't do some of the stuff that he was doing with his images in the dark room. You know what I mean? Like, so I think mm. he set the bar pretty high for us and I know it's the cookie cutter answer, but a lot of times, I mean, for me, it's actually a, a real strong passion for him because I mean, I even reached out to their, uh, to the Ansel Adams trust and was like wow. trying to teach courses for them. I mean, it was like, oh, really? I, I drank really? that Kool-Aid man. And that was way at the beginning of my career, but <laughs> I, awesome. I, I've read every one of his books. I've I have all of his picture books that you can find out there, and 
if I ever need inspiration on landscape photography, it's it's Ansel Adams, hundred percent. But you know, you say speaking ever looking for inspiration in photography, but you know, recently you've come across the most inspirational photographer in the globe, really, at the moment. I mean, he's based out of BC. You know, he's somebody who kind of knows everything and, and really inspires everybody every day to get out of bed. The mindset to actually use a camera. So, and that's Mr. Gavin Hardcastle. You know, and we mentioned him a number of times actually on the podcast. He's, you know, a good friend of the podcast. So tell us, I suppose, how did Gavin inspire you so much that you said, you know what? Yeah, I think I want to work with you guys. The funny thing about Gavin is most people don't even know this. Probably Gavin doesn't even know this, but back in <laughs> 2015... Yeah, it was 2014 or 2015. I was asked by Digital Photography School to do an article. So I was like, okay, well, let me take a look at, I always do my research and I see how other people write on their website so that I made sure that mine wasn't too far-fetched or over the top. And I kept coming across this guy named Gavin Hardcastle on there. It was like 2015. So I read all of his articles. I'm like, man, this guy must be awesome. And then I, and then I met him. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Nice little jab at Gavin. No, I, I love Gavin. So I met him at out of uh, Moab a couple years ago. <laughs> and uh, we just we just hit it off right away. I was like, uh, at first I was like, how does a cartoon character exist in real life? Uh, <laughs> but then he actually has the ability to talk straight, too. So I was like, wait a second. This guy's like, he's awesome because he can... He can have a legitimate conversation with me, but then make me feel like an idiot, but then make me laugh about the fact that I'm an idiot. And I'm like, this guy's awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and you know what? I suppose I saw the video that you guys, you guys did. Um, the, the first one, I suppose, when you butchered his image. But, you know, did you actually uh, send on an image or a copy of that to Adam Gibbs as well? Because you kind of brought Adam into the fray as well in that Photoshop exercise, didn't you? I did. I don't know Adam, but I knew that that would be like a, like a gut wrench to him from all of his other posts on there. So I, I follow all of his stuff. So once I saw that landscape photographer of the year thing, I had to incorporate that into ours. Um, just yes. cause it, that was, it was hilarious. His whole, his, the way he just, he has that thread. Again, we talk about the common thread that weaves through, but his thread of, you know, the comedic value that he also adds to really, I, I would say a really great photography education too. I'm not, I'm not joking, but I really do enjoy the way he thinks about a composition. He's very serious and very deliberate about his practice. Um, yes. and I think it's really impressive the stuff that he comes out with in the end. Um, but he does, I, you know, I think he jokes around a, a little too much with that and doesn't give himself enough credit because he knows a lot more about Photoshop than he'll lead you to believe. I can say, <laughs> you know, just by looking at his images, I'm like, he knows a lot. He's just, you know, messing around. But on, on the video that we did together, uh, when he put the, uh, delicate arch over my mustache that was just yeah that that was oh that was just genius you know i mean like we we we, we could watch it on this end and see what he was doing but obviously you didn't know what he was doing on the other end i suppose or did you know no i had no idea no i, mean, I had no genius. idea that was genius just like in his video he had no idea that i was putting you know what i was gonna yes. put in there i told him on the phone yes. i said i'm gonna do something to this that you're just gonna think is just outrageous and he's like, okay, whatever, you know. So we're doing the thing, and he's like, oh, I'm learning all, I'm learning a lot. And he's like, oh, you got to be shitting me! Like, <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. We have a good time. Yeah. Oh, you know, he did inspire me to start doing some vlogging stuff too. So I get out now. You know, I got a vlogging set up, and not right now, obviously, but you know, when things get back into yes. where they should be, then I'll be doing that as well. So. That's awesome. That's really cool. So let, look here. let's hold that thought. We'll just go for a quick, our last break of this evening and we'll be right back with our funny story and our VSP. Are you tired of running out of power at that crucial moment? Do you need to charge two batteries simultaneously or charge on the go while in your car? The award-winning Pro Cube 2 from Halo has got you covered. Available for Canon, Nikon, Sony and Panasonic. Visit Halo.ie. And you're very welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast. And we're still here with our main man, our good old buddy, Blake Rudis, and oh, no. the fella from Cork, unfortunately. But still, I'm still here. So we've come, to the, we've come to the segment of the show where we always ask a special oh. guest to give us a funny story or maybe even some dirt like we did last week with, uh, with Michael Shanebloom. So, Blake, have you any funny story or even dirt in someone? It's up to you, buddy. What do you think? Um. <laughs> So, you know, there's oftentimes people email me like, man, I would love to just go on a workshop with you. And I'm like, I don't do workshops. Um, I've done a handful of them. 
And one of the reasons why is I'm I'm like the bumbling idiot out there. So like we're we're in Yosemite, and I put my camera bag on the wall um, that's right in front of Tunnel View, that big massive view that you know looks like the view itself yeah. looks like a tunnel, but it's right outside the Tunnel of Yosemite. So I I had my my gear bag set up there, and I was going to grab something out of it and didn't realize that it was still open. And I think I went to go put yeah I went to go put it on my back and the thing came open and all my Sony batteries just went tumbling down like a fifty foot cliff. Oh, no. Now and if you know anything about that spot now not only did I have six attendees with me but there was also like forty five oh. or fifty photographers all tripod sticks lined up on top of each other on this wall waiting for sunrise and man it was there was not a dry eye from all the laughter but it is what it is. There was another time I was at. Uh, Thor as well with another workshop group. And I was like, you guys have to be really careful here. Make sure you don't fall. Slipped, fell, <laughs> slammed the side of my camera. Like, yep, I'll be the one that takes it. I'll be the one that takes it. So, I mean, it's really this just a multitude of do. things. <laughs> yeah. There was one time I was teaching at a workshop and I was telling everyone, and that was when I was doing uh, all inclusive ones. We all lived in the same house and then we would just, you Ooh. know, eat dinner together and critique together and, um, I was telling everybody, charge your batteries, charge your batteries, you know, uh, got to have good charge batteries in the morning. So we go and we get all of our stuff and we're hop out of the car, gorgeous sun sunrise, probably the best sunrise we'd ever had. And uh, I take out my camera to show them what I've got set up on my display and I got nothing. I didn't, I didn't bring my batteries with me. I left them home. So here I'm telling them. Charge their batteries. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm the worst. Uh, I'm the guy that's going to leave the memory card at home. And it's, you know, like, I think I'm a pretty smart dude, but I just, for some reason, especially when the pressure's on. Now, if I go out by myself, none of that ever happens. But if I'm teaching a workshop, something dumb's going to happen. Wow. That's, that's, that's funny. That is... It's ironic more than funny, really, to be honest with you. The fact that you tell them to do this thing and then you went away fucking done it. Oh, that's brilliant. That's absolutely No sooner than when I told them not to fall, I slipped and fell. And, and I didn't just slip and fall. I'm like, oh, that was a bad one. No, I was like, <laughs> like 180 pounds well, of man for falling telling with us. the camera. <laughs> Oh my God! Fair play to you for telling us, because if that had me, I wouldn't tell a single person in the world, man. I'd be like, no, that did not happen. No, <laughs> no, it happened definitely. Happened. But, well, you know, it can happen to the best of us at the best of times, I suppose, really. And you know, like, did you break anything when when you had those falls? Did anything? Like, obviously, the batteries went down the cliff; they were gone. But did you break anything with the falls? No. No, I never broke anything. I um, I have some dings on the side of my old Canon from the fall at Thor as well. Um, but nothing broke. Um, I've never broken a lens. Um, never, you know, none of that stuff, but, um, I've dropped a few polarizing filters off of cliffs before taking them off, putting them oh, on, yeah. you know, that happens all oh, the time, yeah. but oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's all about it, yeah. 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 yeah, they need to make those <laughs> things like yeah. they need to make biodegradable ones. I'd buy a hundred of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not at the price of the Lee polarizing filters that go over the age of 200 oh, and whatever. Okay, they are. No crap. That's, that's, that's for price. real. Yeah. Mm. You know, speak, speaking of gear, Blake, you know, we have a regular segment on the podcast here. It's called a VSP. It means a very solid product. And, you know, I don't know, actually, I'll ask you, you know, do you like things that are shiny? Do you have to have shiny things? Because if you do, you've got a kindred spirit there in Dermot because he is the king of gas. I presume you've heard of gas before, yeah? Yeah, yeah, gear acquisition, yep. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, let me ask you, do you have a product that you swear by that you don't leave home without and you'd say, you know what, I put my name to it. It's a Irish Photography Podcast VSP. You should have it. Do you have something like that? Hmm. I mean, <laughs> like, does it have to be a brand specific or just a thing? No. Can be. A, think of it this way, right? I selected a five cent coin one time. So if you found your base plate, if you lost your base plate tightener, use a five cent coin. So there should be five cent coin in every camera bag if you're lucky to have more than one. I do have a coin so in my I, camera bag just for that. There you go. So yeah. that's a VSP for me. That's the cheapest VSP we've ever had. Oh, <laughs> that we've ever had was a Canon 5D SR or RS, whatever it is. So like yeah, you can see, go from five grand to five cents. It's up to you. I don't really place a lot of value in my gear itself or my cameras itself, you know, cause I learned with like, 
when I first started my blog, I was like, you know, I told my wife, she was like, why don't you go out and buy a camera? Cause you got this blog now. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like I'm not going to buy a new camera unless my blog can pay for it. And that was kind of like my way, my incentive to myself to make and monetize on my yeah. blog. Um, so I'm not yeah. really big on like gear as far as like, Oh, I got to have that. Um, but, um, when it comes to post-processing, I think every single person should have a pen and tablet period like the Wacom, mm. but I don't actually recommend Wacom. Now I like Wacom because they're great, but there's a company called XP pen and they make a little one called the star G 640. No bells, no whistles. It's a pen and it's pressure sensitivity. That's it. And it's like mm -hmm. 30 bucks on Amazon. And it's like the most amazing piece of gear that I have because you know, I've had problems with Wacom drivers, not working with my PC and I have to turn off the Wacom tablet, turn it back on, restart this, restart. I don't have to do anything with this, with this thing. So I like Wacom for their quality because it, it really is good stuff. But this, this XP pen star G640 tablet, man, I'm telling you is like cream of the crop. It, it has no buttons. It's like, let me see. It's, it's this big, no buttons. Oh, wow. okay. Nothing pretty about it. Look how much I use it. You see how much I use it? <laughs> yeah, we can see how much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'd say everyone has to have that. Well, I I tried to to see if I could get into using the uh, the tablets, and I bought not a Wacom one. I don't know what one it was. Was one I bought generic brand, and actually it can change because you do get the kinetic connection, let's just say, with your image by having that touch point by using the pen, and it's something that we've all done since we were so young. And now to bring that into from a Photoshop point of view, I think it's a really interesting thing, actually, because I want to get better. I try and force myself. I'm at that stage now where I kind of go, OK, force yourself to do it or go back to the old habit, let's just say. So maybe now as I start to learn more about Photoshop, I'll bring myself over to use the tablet as well more so. Yeah, you should. And what like get ambidextrous with it. That's how you should be training yourself. So if okay. you've never used a pen before, get ambidextrous with it so that you can have the mouse in one hand and the pen in the other hand, and then you can move around your image with the mouse and then pen with the other hand. So I'm actually left-handed mouse, but I'm a right-handed person. So I use okay. my left-hand mouse and then my right hand does the pen. So dear Mid, you got a space there in the shelf behind you. Is it, it's not that shiny, is it really, Blake? No? No, it's, it's not shiny. Dark, it? Yeah, I don't know if you'll get it or not. It has to be kind of shiny. I'm not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could put silver tape on it if you wanted to. You know, you can make it shine. Some... Ah, there we go. I'll buy it. So I'll buy it. Let's go. Get, <laughs> get a hot go. glue gun and a bedazzler and just, you know. <laughs> oh, now you're talking my language. Yeah, bedazzle the <laughs> shit out of that. <laughs> yeah. Shine in your images and on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, come here. Uh, Blake, what's next for you? as soon as this world gets back on his feet, and you might not even need it to get back on his feet, but what's next for Blake? Oh gosh, I don't know. I've got like, I always have like five or six projects going on at the same time. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, I guess I could tell you, but it, I've got like five, I really have five courses I'm working on at the same time. It's just a, it's a matter wow. of what I want to do when and what I feel like doing when I wake up that morning. So basically at this point, we can either let this thing take us down or we can do something about it just to kind of give people some inspiration if they're wondering. Back in 2013, um, I was working in the, in the military, still am, but back then I was full time. And we got what's called furloughed, where the government didn't have the money to pay the military. So they mm -hmm. told me to go home. I was on a trip. They said, get a plane ticket, come home as soon as possible, and you don't have a job until we say you do. And I was like, okay. So someone told me that the military was job security, and I'd always have a job. Yes. Right? yes. Um, that wasn't necessarily <laughs> the case. So I got home, and I told my wife what happened, and she's like, so what's going to happen? I said, I don't know. She said, well what are you going to do while you're off? And I said, I don't know. I mean, drink beer and watch TV. That's, like, that's my plan. And she was like, well, how about you go work on your blog just like you would work at work and see how much you can get done? I was like, man, there's a reason well, why I married this woman. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. so I did absolutely. that. I just, I dived in every morning. I woke up and I worked for myself as if I worked for myself for about two mm -hmm. weeks. And at the end of that two weeks, I came up with my first course that I produced. Uh, I came up with my first subscription website after two weeks. And then I basically had kickstarted my business. So once I went back to work, um, I just kind of did both at the same time until my business 
took off and was paying yeah. me more than what the military could pay me. And that's when I went from full-time to part-time because I'm in the National Guard. So I mm-hmm. tell people that because this is an opportunity where you have all the time in the world to learn something new for sure, but you also have God-given gifts that you have that you could double down on right now. So when this thing does turn around, um, you know, at this point, people have been sitting around for maybe a month. You know, there's things yes, that people yeah. could have been doing, businesses that they could have been building, uh, thoughts and stuff that they could have been putting together. People could have written a book in this time. You know, I mean, there's so much stuff that you can do when you have even just two weeks just to devote to yourself. And I think what a lot of people are going to learn at the end of this is that we weren't necessarily designed to work nine to five. You know, we were designed to actually double down on our passions. And I guarantee when people go all in on themselves and put them chips towards themselves and, and springboard off the, the hobbies. I mean, who would have thought that I could make a successful career off of teaching Photoshop online? Like I'm, I'm a Photoshop nerd and I make a living Mm -hmm. off of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can turn anything into a business. You can monetize anything and everyone has something that they can do. So, you know, what's next? I don't know. Maybe motivational speaker. Yeah. You heard it here first. Yeah. Here he goes. Launch on the new platform. Yeah. 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 Yep. I don't know, <laughs> but I just think that there's a, there's a lot of things that people can be doing for themselves right now. Instead of being down on themselves, what they could be doing for themselves. So that when this is over, they're reinvigorated. They're not starting from yes. square one. They're like, I've already been, yes. I know what's going on. I got this. Yes. And you also have something to show for it at the very, very end of it as well. And, you know, like we've mentioned a number of things here, how to improve photography and how to improve your end game, I suppose, by using Photoshop. And, you know, from the people who wouldn't have heard of you, I hope they've learned a lot even talking with us here this evening. But where can people find out more information on Blake and the F64 Academy? Yeah, so if you just go to f64academy.com, um, the best thing to do is wait for that little pop-up to come when you try to leave and then enter yes. your email. Um, and the reason why I say that is that I, I'm not one of those people that just is going to spam you with sales. Um, I'm the type of person who genuinely wants to see every photographer become a better photographer. So okay. I make sure that I put out value and real value and things that are going to help people grow. So, um, that email list capture thing there isn't just because I want to send you some, you know, spam you with buy my stuff. It's because I want to mm-hmm. genuinely make you a better photographer, whether you're paying me money or you're not. Um, that's what I want to do there on F64 Academy. So join the email list on F64 Academy. And, uh, if you have any questions, if anybody has any questions, they can reply to any email I send and I respond to pretty much everything that hits my inbox. So brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, I'm so glad that you responded to the mail that I sent you to ask you to come on to the podcast. It's been phenomenal. I've really enjoyed the chat this evening. And, uh, you know, I wish you the best for the future. And from everybody in Ireland, thanks very much, Blake, and Shlán Thank you so much. It's been a Shlán Gafol. Say Ayo. Ayo. Hey, guys. If you dig what you're hearing, why don't you jump over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star rating and don't forget to share with your friends. With all that done, we'll see you next week. And remember, keep shooting.